We're very fortunate today to be joined by two of the most distinguished economists of our time, Steve Hankey and John Cochran, both coming from different schools of thought regarding how inflation is caused. We've been talking about the causes of inflation, the outlook of inflation, and the outlook for the economy and monetary policy, and much more. The two gentlemen have uh, no need for introduction, but I will announce their bios. Steve Hankey is a professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University. He has correctly called in the show that inflation would tick up to 6 to 9%, and so far it has. He is a senior fellow at the Independent Institute and has served as a special counselor for the Center of Financial Stability. He has been a currency reformer in many emerging countries, including Argentina, Jamaica, Russia, and Venezuela and Yugoslavia, and he formerly served as a senior economist at Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. On the other corner, we have John Cochran, who is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. John has previously been on the show earlier in the summer and has correctly called that the Fed would not pivot in 2022. So far, that has been correct. His upcoming book, The Fiscal Theory of the Price Level, will be released on January 17th in the new year. He blogs at The Grumpy Economist and is a frequent contributor to The Wall Street Journal, and he was formerly a professor of finance at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Gentlemen, I'm very honored to be hosting both of you at the same time. What a treat for me and our audience. Welcome back to Kitco. Good to be here. Absolutely. Um, Good to we're be gonna, with John. Yeah, I, I, I understand you're acquainted to, uh, with each other and you've um, known each other for a while. So it's great to bring in uh, two great minds of economics who uh, come from uh, different schools of thought and can enlighten us on all aspects of uh, the economy. Now, let's start with economic growth before we drill down into uh, the more particular details of uh, the economy, including inflation. Uh, everyone wants to know whether or not a recession, technically and or economically speaking, will actually happen in 2023. Whether or not we are already in a recession is a separate question. But let me, ans let me ask the first question um, first to you. What, uh, will we see a recession in 2023? Uh, Steve, let's start with you. The answer to that is yes. The rate of growth, either nominal or real, is determined by changes in the money supply. And for the last seven months, the money supply has actually contracted by a percent and a half, which is unprecedented uh, in the post-World War II era. So with the usual transmission lags between changes in the money supply and changes in real economic activity, we the window is 2023. That is the recession window. We will have a recession in 2023. Um, John, I'll let you respond. Okay, well, I'm not so sure. And uh, uh, economists are actually not so sure. Uh, one of the big things I got, bad news I got to tell you, uh, nobody really knows. Uh, now, Steve and I agree on a lot of things, actually, but one we disagree on is how important it is to look at the money supply, because our Fed doesn't control the quantity of money. So the amount of money out there is pretty much whatever people want it to be. Our Fed controls interest rates. So I, my perspective on inflation looks more at interest rates and fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a danger of recession. It's certainly just look historically. Uh, and sometimes the Fed, when raising interest rates to combat inflation, overdoes it and sends us into a recession. A recession needs a shock. It needs something bad to happen. So excessive um, overdoing it on interest rates could be a shock and something bad could happen coming along. Uh, but um, I don't see anything built in that, uh, you know, a bad shock, a, cri a financial crisis, something like that, that is uh, automatically going to send us, you know, in, into a steep recession. Okay. So just, I'll give it a qualified maybe. <laughs> I'm just going to follow up on that before I go back to Steve. Now, John, you are also the uh, research associate. We're a research associate at the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research. It's the uh, organization that officially determines whether or not we are in a recession. Have you heard um, anything from the uh, NBER regarding this issue and whether or not they've decided to announce a recession yet? Well, they're they're very good about uh, not saying anything ahead of time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> not gossiping with me. Fair but, enough. Uh, let's let's see what they do here. Uh, um, you would think that people who are out of jobs know well enough if there's in a recession, they don't need a bunch of economists to bless holy water on it, and that is in many ways true. The NBER uh, declares a recession, uh, roughly speaking, when we see two quarters of GDP going down in a row. Uh, that's not an ironclad rule. They look over, they want to see lots of different areas going down together. So 
they have a kind of a, 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 a informal procedure for smelling if this phenomenon is there. Mm-hmm. And they'll declare it. They always declare it after the fact anyway. Um, it raises the question, is a recession really a, a separate phenomenon or is it just a time when GDP happens to go down? That, that's a big, deep question. But don't wait for it. I think Steve and I will be happy to call it recession if we see, um, G, if we see incomes going down, unemployment going up, uh, you know, general bad times. That'll be a recession and you'll, you'll know it uh, looking out the window before the NBER tells you officially. All right. Well, Steve, uh, you and I have talked about this before. Uh, You know, there's been a lot of political back and forth about whether or not we are technically or have been technically in a recession. Uh, But just politics aside, looking at the economic indicators, John mentioned a few unemployment, among other things. What economic indicators do you look for, Steve, that would point to you that we are definitively in a recession? Well, first of all, uh, Let me quote Milton Friedman and remind you, Milton said monetary policy is not about interest rates, it's about the growth and the quantity of money. So we we have to look at the quantity of money, and if we look at the quantity of money, and and we know there are lags between changes in the quantity of money and economic activity, that, that, that is the reason that I am saying that I think the window is 2023 and that we will have a recession because the only times we've had contractions in the money supply on a sustained basis like we've had recently is, is 1929. Mm-hmm. You know what happened then. Of course, it was, a, it was a, a lot bigger contraction than we have witnessed at present. But there also was a contraction in 1937 and there was a recession, of course, following that. So I, I'm i just looking at the money supply and uh, more, more or less in, a, in an old Milton Friedman Cadillac with N- MV equals PY on the license plate, you know. Yeah, we will. Money uh, times velocity equals the price level times real economic plus real economic activity. So, yeah. so that's where I see it. Now, one, one thing that I, uh, that was I thought interesting that John pointed out is that the money supply we have to look at is is really the broad measure of money. The, the amount of money people in the non-bank public, as they call it, have in their pocket that they can spend. And that's the kind of money supply I'm talking about, what they call a measure M2. But, but that's produced primarily, as John said, by banks. 75% of M2 is produced by banks, not the Fed. Everybody keeps looking at the Fed all the time. And, and the, they don't, pr- the elephant in the room are banks, not the Fed. The Fed okay. is a bank, but I'm talking about commercial banks. So this point John's raising is very interesting. Now, the thing with the interest rates and Milton Friedman is interesting too, because we have had periods, for example, three uh, that I have noted, 1964, we had a huge increase in the federal funds rate from 3.4% to 5.8. And what happened? The economy just kept zooming along <laughs> because of banks, there was demand for credit and the banks were willing to loan it at whatever the interest rate was. And the unemployment rate then actually fell from 5.1% to 3.6%. Then we had the same thing in 84. The Fed funds rate zoomed 9.6% to 11.6%. And the unemployment rate actually fell from 7.8 to 7.5. And then 93, 95, we doubled the Fed funds rate from 3% to 6%. And the unemployment fell from 6.5 to 5.8. Now, what happens there is that there's a lot of confidence in the economy. There's, a, there's increasing demand. The demand curve for credit is shifting out to the right. And even though the Fed funds rate goes up, the commercial right. banks are pumping out credit. All and, right. and that is what makes the money supply go. But it's the money supply, ultimately. Okay. Let's, so the uh, trick is, well, who's contributing what? And and how they're going to be reacting right now, right. the increases in the Fed funds rate and this contraction that we have going on. 
let's give uh, let's give John a chance to respond. Now, I was going to talk about economic growth, but we'll come back to that. I think uh, <laughs> the conversation has steered towards uh, the causes of inflation. Uh, now, John, you do subscribe to the fiscal theory of the price level. Uh, that is in the uh, opening uh, chapter of your new book. Uh, let's talk about that. And uh, before that, let, I'll, I'll give you a chance to respond to what Professor Hanke just said in regards to the uh, quantity theory of money. Um, and uh, and we'll talk about whether or not that uh, is indeed the uh, the sole cause of inflation, as as as, as Professor Henke would uh, would have described it to be. So I'll let you respond, John. So you knew we were going to walk out on money here, right? <laughs> <laughs> no way to avoid. I, I it. expected this to come later in the conversation, but let's let's do it now. <laughs> yeah, um, I love Milton. David. What what you're going to be surprised of, David, is that we <laughs> actually both agree. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's see. Let's see how the conversation flows. John, I'll let you respond. I love Milton Friedman, and um, most of what he said was right and genuinely insightful. Uh, but not everything, and not everything continues to apply to today's uh, economy. Uh, you know, when when the economy booms, people go out to dinner more, and when there's a recession, people to go out to dinner less. That doesn't mean telling people to go out to dinner is going to make the economy boom. Uh, it's the old correlation and causation problem of, of money and uh, income statistics. The real question uh, here, the theoretical question we're thinking is, um, does the composition of your portfolio matter now? <laughs> what does that mean? I think Steve and I both agree that if the government prints up $5 trillion worth of money and sends it to people as checks, you're going to get inflation. And that's what we just did. <laughs> I call that fiscal policy. Uh, Steve might call that monetary financing of, uh, of deficits. Uh, but that's what happened. Why? Because people feel wealthier. They've got overall more stuff than they need. The, the, the wonky question on, on money versus other features is, do you really care? Suppose instead of 10,000 bucks in your bank account, uh, I give you 1,000 bucks in your bank account and $9,000 in a uh, mutual fund that holds treasury bills. That's not money anymore. It's the same amount of wealth, but in a different form. Is that going to make you all of a sudden say, oh, no, I can't spend any money. Uh, I'm going to go out. Uh, you know, we're going to have to have a recession. And that's, I think, where I and the monetarists um, uh, disagree, especially because today, as, as Steve said, the banks create most of this M2 internally, and there's right. no control on them. There are no reserve requirements anymore. Uh, money is whatever people want it to be. So I don't see the money as having a causal impact. I don't think, for example, could we have avoided the current inflation? If the Treasury had simply sent sent people five trillion dollars of Treasury bills, or five trillion dollars in a in an account that in a uh, mutual fund that holds Treasury bills, instead of sending them M two, uh, we would have had the same equation. People have more stuff than they need; they they buy it. So that's the subtle distinction between monetary and fiscal theories, and it is uh, fairly subtle. But as a fiscal theorist, I look at the primary cause of our current inflation uh -huh. being that that five trillion dollars of of deficit, uh -huh. uh, no matter how it was it was financed, and that's you know that's what caused our inflation, and then that's I think a little bit why it's currently fading away. Uh, before we continue, and I will give uh, uh, Steve a chance to respond. Uh, uh, let me just make sure we're both talking about the same thing because I have had guests on the show that subscribe to the Austrian theory of economics that have said that the definition of inflation is simply the increase of money supply and credit. Are we talking about that or are we talking about the increase in asset prices and perhaps just consumer prices? Uh, what, what are we talking about specifically when we talk about inflation right now? Well, let me jump in on that one. Let's yeah. define our term. It's a great yes. idea. Yeah. Inflation means inflation. <laughs> and it means the, okay. uh, the consumer price index, the, the, the okay. price of everything going up. And I would include in the phenomenon, the, the prices going up and wages going up, the phenomenon inflation is, now we're kind of getting towards what the Austrian says, a decline in the value of money. Uh, the dollar is worth less in terms of all the stuff you might buy with the dollar. That's inflation. Where people get confused is confusing relative prices with inflation. Uh, you see the price of TVs go up and you say, oh, there's TV inflation. You mm -hmm. see the price of assets going up and you say, oh, there's asset inflation. Well, that's one price going up relative to another. That happens. And that's important. But the phenomenon we're after is the underlying part of all prices, all wages, everything going up. And the only thing that's going down is the value of the dollar. So that, I think, is the phenomenon uh, we're after. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor Hanke, I... Uh, a counter argument to your point that I've heard, and I, I know what you're going to say because we've talked about this. But uh, in the last uh, quanti uh, in the last uh, QE periods, QEs one, two, three, and four during the 2000s, we've seen an increase in the Fed balance sheet, 
and arguably an increase in the money supply, but no real inflation. Can you explain that phenomenon? Well, this gets in also into definitions, and that is that uh, we had, uh, of course, uh, Lehman went down in 2008. We had the Great Recession. And what happened is that the contribution of the commercial banks to broad money, M2, actually went south. It started contracting. And in response to that, the Fed engaged in QE1. QE2 and QE3 to increase their contribution to broad money M2. Now, on balance, and the reason people are confused about this, the, the Fed, the state money produced by the Fed, that's what's called M sub zero. That's a monetary base. That's a narrow measure of money. And, and that zoomed up. It, 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 it increased tremendously. If you look at... Uh, 2008, for example, state money produced by the Fed at that time was only 11% of total M2. Now, as John and I were just talking earlier, it's 25% the Fed. So the proportion of state money, so-called base money or high-powered money or M sub zero has, has increased tremendously due to the okay. quantitative easing and the expansion of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. But you have to look at what's happening to M2. And in the Great Recession, it never grew very fast. That's why everyone was off base. They said, oh, we're going to have hyperinflation. The Fed is expanding its balance sheet, going wild with quantitative easing. The point was that at the same time, commercial banks were cutting back and if you looked at broad money in total, in aggregate, it wasn't growing very fast. It was growing only about four and a half, five and a half percent through mm -hmm. all the Great Recession. And of course, that's my point. We never got inflation because broad money was never really growing very fast. Okay. So it depends on what money measure you're actually looking at and the appropriate I one. See. Is the, is the broadest one you can find, the uh, could, money that is being held by the by the public. This is a great case where uh, two diff totally different perspectives give the same answer. So I look at the quantitative easing, and I also say basically did absolutely nothing, but for a totally different reason. Mm -hmm. uh, what the Fed did, it, pr it produced a lot of money, bank reserves, uh, but it took in treasuries. So it bought like $3 trillion of treasuries and gave out $3 trillion of bank reserves. To me, that's like I take in your 20s and I give you two fives and a 10. What do you care whether you have 20s or two fives and a 10? It's not going to affect your spending whatsoever, whatsoever. It's a shortening of the maturity structure of government debt, not particularly important. So from the same, for totally different perspective, you get the same answer. Uh, much ado about nothing, but except maybe letting the Fed trumpet, look, we're doing something, we're doing something. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I, 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 I would say on that round, it was fortunate that they did something because the regulations with the Dodd-Frank regulations and Basel III were, were crimping the, the commercial banks tremendously. And if the Fed had not done something, we, we would have had more than a, than, a, than a mild recession and slow recovery. Well, we can dump on the Dodd-Frank Act and financial regulation anytime you like, but <laughs> uh, we'll let our host, uh, uh, our host has to unleash us on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, what, what if there's a, let me just posit this question and I'll let whoever want to answer it, take it. Uh, what if there's a liquidity trap, which is defined by low interest rates, but a high savings rate and none of the money that's being created is actually being utilized by consumers? In that scenario, even if you have an increase in the M2, would you still get inflation? Yes. No. Okay, please, let's talk. So we were in a liquidity trap the whole 2010s. Interest rate was zero. That's the definition of a liquidity trap. Bonds and money are completely perfect substitutes. And so when the Fed buys treasuries and issues reserves, nobody cares about treasuries versus reserves. Um, and the lovely thing, we learned something beautiful. Uh, the liquidity trap, people disparage it. It's wonderful. Uh, we got 0% interest rates. Inflation went absolutely nowhere. People worried about it's 1.7, not 2%. Goodness gracious. You know, <laughs> that, that's, that's absolute success in terms of monetary policy. Milton Friedman, who I will quote approvingly this time, uh, 
um, he called that the optimum quantity of money. Zero interest rates and inflation going nowhere is absolutely perfect because no one spends any time on cash management or worrying about things. So yeah, we were in a liquidity trap the whole time uh, and it was a great and good thing. Steve, why do you say yes? Well, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the money supply growth and it was, it, it, the, the, the money supply was, was growing at a very slow rate and, and that explains why we had low inflation and that mm -hmm. explains also why market interest rates were fairly low because interest rates follow inflation. They, they don't lead inflation, they follow wait, wait, inflation. Steve, Steve, I, I got to push you on this. When interest rates are zero and when money and bonds pay the same interest, why does anybody care whether they hold money or hold bonds? Why do you care about savings versus money? Money is savings at that point. So we just awash in liquidity and don't worry well, about the money supply. It loses well, its connection to output. I uh, my yeah, my only reaction to that, John, is that that, that all those all those components are contained in M two. So I'm just looking at M two. So it's all in M two. So uh, no, no, no. Uh, bonds are not in M two. Uh, um, uh, mutual funds well, are uh, not in M two. Treasury the, the, bills the, are not the in money, the Treasury money bonds are not in M two. Money it's market. All about money. Market. The whole theory is money vehicles that are providing liquidity versus savings vehicles that are something different. And the composition of these of where where your wealth goes in these two things matters. That's monetarism. Overall quantities of this stuff, that's fiscal theory. Okay. Um well if I if I look at the over you know, I, I just I just finished something up and I, I looked at I updated Warren Weber uh former Minneapolis Fed uh, economist, who I'm certain you're, you know, Warren. Uh, I updated a study that Warren did a number of years ago in which I related the growth rate in the money supply to inflation rates. And I had a base of 147 countries and the money supply measure I used was M2. And what do we end up with? We have almost a perfect correlation. <laughs> oh, wait, I, I, grant, I granted you that already. Steve, I granted you that already. We have a great correlation between money and inflation. The same way we have a great correlation between people going out to dinner and the state of the economy. But correlation isn't causation. We've known that forever. Demand for all sorts of things goes up when the economy goes up. Well, it, it, I, I also ran a regression with that, and, and that does imply causation. Oh, no, no, no. Regressions a, don't imply causation. Come, come now. Regressions imply correlation. I say, I, I, I say, I say imply. I didn't, I didn't say mean. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you end up with, with essentially the same thing. The, 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 the uh, regression equation shows up at, a, you know, a, a, almost a one-to-one -one relationship, too. So if you increase the money supply, you get essentially a proportional increase in inflation. And if we go back, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at, and I have it in front of me because it's one of your old colleagues, Al Harberger, who, now Al was a professor at the University of Chicago. John knows him very well. He's, he's actually, he's 98 years old right now. So he's been around a long time. He did not win a Nobel Prize, but in, in my book, yeah. he, he was maybe the best all around applied economist at Chicago. Now, he, he wrote a paper in 1978 in the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking, a primer on inflation. And Harberger starts out by essentially having the whole first section indicating that the key lesson from table one is that there is a close relationship between the rate of inflation and the increase in the money supply. And so that's the first part of the paper. But the second part of the paper gets more into John Cochran. And, and he asked the question, he said, well, he said, that's step one. Step two is, what, what is what's behind this? What's causing it? And Harberger concluded that for systemic inflations or acute inflations, now acute inflations are like hyperinflation where you have inflation over 50% per month. 
That I can tell you. I've studied every hyperinflation, John. There are now 63. I just got a new one last week. The, the Lotz ghetto in, in Poland uh, had a hyperinflation episode. And all of those are connected with fiscal positions and fiscal policy. They, they have all been, uh, they've all had huge, just, just a second, they, they, they all, they all have Go ahead. had huge fiscal deficits and those deficits have been monetized and financed by central banks. Yep. And, and, and one I know in particular, by the way, is Yugoslavia. In January of 1994, the hyperinflation rate was 313 million percent per month, and and about 97 percent of the debt of, of the fiscal expenditures were being financed by the central bank. I mean, they they, they the, just a, a massive deficit. So that's the that's the acute thing, but also the chronic picture. Harburger goes through, especially with Latin American countries where you have in, kind of endemic inflation. And what happens, you, you have a huge fiscal deficit and the fiscal authorities come in with basically with a pistol and put it at the head of the governor of the central bank. And they say, we've got some wonderful bonds we're going to sell you. And what happens? He, he buys them and that increases the money supply. So the nexus of inflation with the money supply is always there. But if you go under the hood and start looking at why the money supply is growing, then you're getting into the Cochrane kind of territory. And for chronic and acute inflations, you will find a fiscal story behind it. Now, now let, let me just, just take a, a moment because this, this work that Cochrane's doing, David, is very important. This, this book that's going to be coming out January 17th is a, is a must read. So excess money always causes inflation. I've, I've never seen anyone that's pinpointed an example where you've had sustained inflation that's not been preceded or accompanied with excess money growth. But a central bank can boost the money supply independent of a government's fiscal position. And they can do this one of two ways. They can either allow interest rates, push interest rates down low, at a low level by buying domestic assets. This is your liquidity trap type thing. Or the second way, they can keep the exchange rate undervalued by buying foreign assets. Now, if we look at the United Kingdom, we have a good example and the United Kingdom uh, example where they had, in fact, very tight budgets, 1970 surplus, 8.2% of GDP, 71, 6.4 surplus, 72, 3.5 surplus, surplus in 73, 74 they had surplus, and they only had a deficit in 1975 but they had tremendous money supply growth. They had fiscal surpluses, tremendous money supply growth, and inflation peaked out in August of 1975 at 26.6%. So that, that's, that's a case that doesn't fit into this fiscal thing. You have huge fiscal surpluses, but a massive growth in the money supply, and they had a massive inflation problem. You also had the same thing, by the way, in Japan. They essentially had balanced budgets in, in the early 1970s, but they ended up with an average inflation of 23.2% in 1974 because the money supply was growing very rapidly. And of okay. course, you can have the converse. We, we have the converse now in Japan. They have a huge fiscal deficit and they don't have much inflation but they don't have much growth in the money supply. Okay, so, uh, John. So, so that's, I'll, that's I'll a little it. bit of a long thing, but, but John, John has written a book over 500 pages long, and I at least get a few minutes to say something about it. No, and, and thank you. And, and you, what you get I mean, a chance is to 
the, the, the most basic misunderstanding is that fiscal theory implies a tight relationship between today's deficits and mm -hmm. today's inflation. It doesn't. Ke Keynesian uh, stuff does, but not for fiscal theory. The bottom line idea is that you get inflation when there's more government debt than people think the government will pay off over decades. So you can run big deficits if people think the government has a way to pay it back, uh, as we do in wartime. Uh, and, and you can run surpluses and have inflation if people think, well, that's only a temporary thing and that's going away. I, I don't know if I really had great trust in the British economy in the early 1970s, and obviously neither did the people who were holding its bonds. So th there is not, it does not predict deficit today equals inflation today, uh, which is great because as Steve pointed out, we see lots of episodes. It's about debt relative to the long run fiscal ability of the government. And that's the important thing to understand. About fiscal is, is there a and lag between, go on. High, <laughs> is there a, well, is, let's explain the lag effect. Is there a lag between uh, increasing budget, uh, government deficits and uh, increased inflation? And on the, on the flip side, increased money supply and increased inflation? Absolutely. First of all, there's lags, as I'm as sure we're going to agree on this one. There's lags in the economy. Prices are a little sticky. It takes time for financial things to spread around. So uh, um, Milton Friedman's great uh, line was that uh, the Fed was like going into the shower and turning on the hot and cold water. You know, just leave it alone a while. It takes a while to, to get through the pipes. Um, but if for, for fiscal theory, there's a, a definite uh, question of the lag because there's this naughty problem right. of they borrowed a lot of money, they printed a lot of money. If the government prints a lot of money and gives you money, but says, hey, we're coming back next year with a lot of taxes, yeah. what do you do? You just hang on to that money so you can pay your taxes. So it's really this delicate issue of, of money and government debt. It's really all the same thing okay. relative to the government's long run ability to pay it back. And that also take some time and, and introduce some uncertainty in the whole issue. Well, uh, I, uh, let's John, bring it to a... John, sorry, John, Alec. John, John, John's making an, an interesting point for me. Just uh, if so, okay, the long run. I, I, I'm, in, I'm in your zone now, John, in the long run. So if you go back to when the bubble burst in Japan in 1990, I mean, that's that's a long time now. And... and the, the average rate of monetary growth since 1990 has been 2.9 percent. The average nominal GDP growth has been a piddling 0.9 percent. That's nominal GDP growth. So they've had essentially no, no inflation, no growth, no growth in the money supply, but a huge increase in debt to GDP and, and deficits. So so can you walk us through the fiscal theory analytics on, on what's going on there? Uh, the what about Japan question. Yeah. <laughs> it's really not a fiscal theory question because this is a question for every theory. Uh, you know, why, if you're a monetarist, well, we got this huge debt. Why have they not printed money to get rid of the huge debt? It's kind of the same question. Uh, now, when you look at Japan, there's a lot of uh, reasons why it's in some sense not as bad as it looks. Uh, one is that the beneficiaries are very low interest rates. So the the, um, the crisis doesn't really happen until interest costs on the debt start swamping the budget. Uh, if interest rates in Japan go up to five or ten percent, you're going to have real trouble because now you got to now you got to refinance that deficit. Japanese debt is held largely by uh, old Japanese people and Japanese institutions. U.S. government debt is largely held by central bankers <laughs> around the world. It's long-term debt. It's subject to an estate tax. There's a lot of assets sitting around in Japan. So Japan ran all these trade surpluses. So they have assets corresponding to these liabilities. A lot of the Japanese debt is held by the Japanese central bank, and they also have foreign assets. So in, in the overall picture, I think Japan is not nearly as, as bad as sometimes um, said. It is benefiting very much from low interest rates, which may not last forever. It's benefiting that its debt is held domestically by people who, unlike Americans, seem uninclined to try to get rid of it and spend it. Uh, it's not it's not subject to the kind of run mechanics. And just wait. <laughs> we are yeah. all of the Western world is sitting on um, whether Japan's 250 and we're only 100 or Japan's really 120 and we're 100. Uh, we're in the 100% debt to GDP. Europe is in the 100% debt to GDP. Uh, all of us, if interest rates go up, we're all, all of our governments are going to have problems refinancing it. We're all heading into entitlement prom uh, promises we don't know how to keep. So the, the question of debt sustainability hangs over all of us and, and not particularly Japan. 
I think for the layman, what they would like to know as well is uh, we've talked about some historical examples. Let's bring it back to a contemporary example. Now, headline CPI, uh, as published by the BLS, has been trending down ever since June, ever since 9.1 percent. We've had uh, every subsequent month was lower than the previous month. Uh, what has caused this downward trend in inflation over the last six months? Steve, I'll start with you. Money supply. <laughs> Money supply. <laughs> More specifically, is it, are we looking at a reduction in the M2, reduction of the Fed balance sheet? A plus for that, John. <laughs> that's not my answer. That's my guess on your answer. It, 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 it has been a, a, a sharp deceleration in, in the money supply and, and there are lags. So we, we still have persistent inflation in the system, but it's coming down. As you know, John Greenwood, who I work with on this, David, uh, and I indicated that by the end of this year, next month, the inflation we predicted some time ago will be between six and eight percent. And we think by the end of 2023, it'll probably be down around five percent. And, and then it might fall very fast, by the way, if, if this contraction in the money supply continues on the sustained basis. OK, so. Um, so Again, we come to the same answer with different, totally different views. Um, inflation's coming down. And I, I went out on a limb and, and actually said that I think that's going to happen a couple months ago. And I'm, I'm glad it is. Um, from the fiscal point of view, why do we have inflation? Because there was this $5 trillion fiscal blowout. The government gave people $5 trillion worth of money. I think Steve might agree with that, too. Didn't really have that much to do with the Fed. It was the Treasury sending people checks. Now, uh, if the government uh, does that, $5 trillion of extra debt, and people don't really think it's good for it, they're going to try and get rid of that stuff. They're going to try and spend it until we inflate away that debt. So what that produces is a, a one-time inflation. Inflation rises until we've inflated away the debt that we, uh, that we sent out, and then it goes away on its own. So the kind of fiscal theory view of it says, yeah, this a one-time fiscal blowout causes a one-time rise in the price level, and when it's done, it's done. Now, the, there's other two other theories that don't uh, that aren't on the show, uh, but they're important for your listeners to think about. Uh, one of them, the most important, is conventional theory of monetary policy, which is neither me nor Steve. The conventional theory focused on interest rates and says that as long as interest rates are below inflation, inflation will accelerate forever. The the inflation spiral theory, and they were also worried at the zero bound era that once if if you have any deflation and interest rates are stuck at zero, deflation spirals out of control. So that was the most commentators were saying with the Fed so slow to act, the Fed sitting with interest rates at zero for a whole year, that was going to cause inflation to spiral out of control. And it's very interesting that we didn't. It didn't. Well, let's let's yeah, find that, some that, common that, ground. Just, oh, sorry. That, that is common ground between both me and, me and Steve, that that view of the world was not true. Whether you think it's the money supply growth or the running out of the fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, shock, uh, we had an important experiment. Inflation didn't spiral out of control. The other view of the world is the supply shocks view of the world, the team transitory. It's all, uh, um, you know, you can't get stuff through the ports and energy price rises and so forth. And that's clearly not true because wages are going up. Everything's going up, not just the things that have supply shocks. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is also a view that says it's it's fading away even without the Fed raising interest rates more than inflation. And that's the key right now. Inflation is going away without the Fed re, uh, repeating 1980. Now, it's not going to go all the way down to 2%, but it's very interesting that it is fading at least as much as it's faded now without repeating that 1980 of what would have to be now, 12, 13, 15% interest rates if you go on this theory that high rates higher than inflation are needed to bring inflation down. That that theory seems not to be true. Um, yeah, that, yeah, we, uh, on just a little footnote on that point, Interest rates were higher than inflation in all the 60s and 70s, and yes. inflation kept, kept going up. Yes. So this is this is exactly consistent with what John is saying. It's just another little piece of evidence. Let, let me ask John a question on the five trillion, John. Uh, the five trillion was was you know <laughs> distributed, shall we say, or in some cases stolen. Uh, with the COVID uh, operation, what what if that five trillion had had ninety over ninety percent of that was monetized by the Fed, meaning that the Fed bought the Treasury bills that were issued to finance 
the deficit created by the five trillion expenditures. What what if the treasuries would have been sold instead of the Fed to the non-bank public, John? Would we have had inflation? Uh, I think yes, possibly less. That's a sort of a second order effect of who holds the treasuries. But uh, you are right. Now, this is one that doesn't distinguish too well between your view and my view, because of the five trillion, it mostly ended up in M2. The Fed, the, the Treasury is actually the Treasury uh, borrowed about two trillion in the markets, and the, it, it borrowed five trillion overall. Two trillion stayed in the markets, about three trillion the Fed bought. Uh, but then the Treasury took that money and largely sent people checks, and checks end up in M2. <laughs> so M2 went up. And total government debt went up, uh, and we had inflation. So we, that's one where we kind of agree on on the process. I think okay, yeah, I, borrowing it in financial markets would have helped. Why? About, because it sends a signal that we're going to pay this stuff back. When you just print the money, that sends a signal that's sitting out here. But when you when you borrow the money from insurance companies, they're more likely to hold on to that debt than just people who receive presents from the government. So, so where, where, we're, where we're in sharp agreement here is, is just what you're talking about with, a, for example, the monetization of, of the deficit that was created with the pandemic. And this goes back to Al Harburger and, and he, where you have endemic or acute inflations, usually it's the same story. There's a huge fiscal deficit that gets monetized. Yeah. And we did that but, one. But, but, but we end up where? With Milton Friedman. It, it's all about money. Well, let's, we, we, now we're going to repeat an argument, which is a bad idea. So, uh, <laughs> In that context that I just mentioned, we're in, we're in full agreement where, where we could have a longer session is, is on the level of debt and whether people think it's going to be paid back and so forth. And uh, the only thing I would make a remark on that, by the way, that, that is related, I think, to your work. And and Sir Alan Walters, who was one of my colleagues in, at Hopkins and a close collaborator, as well as Margaret Thatcher's economic guru, he did a lot of work on levels of debt and, and, and confidence. And what you find out, that this throws the Keynesians a, a, a loop. If the, if the if the debt gets too big and the confidence shrinks, the, the so-called Keynesian multipliers go negative on you. In other words, if you increase Keynesian economics says, if you increase a deficit, that stimulates the economy and that gooses the economy. Well, if the debt is too big and confidence is eroded and people don't think it's going to pay, be paid back and you goose the deficit, make it bigger, what happens? The Keynesian multiplier actually is negative. The economy goes into reverse, and I think that I think that's very much related to what John's work is is all, all right. about. Let me let me ask but you I, a different way. I, I, uh, that, 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 John. <laughs> okay. Um, people have criticized the Federal Reserve uh, for quote unquote acting too slowly, which has caused the current inflationary environment that we're seeing now. Would you agree or disagree with that statement? I mean, you, you've, you've explained your theories quite well. Let's bring it back to uh, what's currently been happening and um, how the Federal Reserve <laughs> reacted to that's, COVID. Yeah. That, that's because they have this interest rate theory of things. Before we got into trouble, they said, we, we will increase interest rates and tighten up as soon as we see inflation flaring up. And now they say we will stop in increasing in interest rates as soon as we see in inflation being eroded. So they're, they're late to the party because they're, they're focused on this interest rate thing. That, that's my view. But let me offer the conventional view, which I think we should respect because <laughs> uh, most people other than me and Steve follow it. That, in, that inflation gets worse as when the interest rate is below the inflation rate. Uh, so by that view of things, uh, waiting a full year uh, made inflation a lot worse, which by the way, even in the evil 1970s, the Fed never waited a whole year before moving. Uh, the Fed was always at least keeping interest rates even with inflation, if not a little bit more than inflation. Inflation got bigger. So that, by the conventional view, that was a big mistake. Now by both Steve and my view, uh, that wasn't a huge mistake. The Fed did, however, uh, make make some very big mistakes. Uh, one, 
the the financial bailouts of the pandemic back to the sort of the Dodd Frank Act stuff. Uh, all of the regulatory schemes uh, promises that we made in 2008 got broken, and, and we probably won't go deep in there. But that really was. Now I don't mind them doing it because you got to put out the fire, but with no shame whatsoever about how uh, now it's just bailout city. We are in bailout city. That's our financial system. Second, as Steve pointed out, they worked with the Treasury and bought three trillion of Treasury debt and monetized it. That certainly was a big part of making this episode more inflationary than it would otherwise been. Third, they completely missed it. We got a staff of thousands of PhD economists. We got an institution whose number one mandate is inflation. And they could not see eight, nine percent inflation coming. They denied it was on its way for a full year. They uh, they said, oh, it's supply shocks and it's in the ports. Well, where are your hundreds of economists calling up the ports every day and seeing, can you get stuff through the ports? Uh, you know, that's supposed to be your job. So an institution whose job it is to see inflation coming and to know something about inflation, missing an eight, nine percent inflation, right. not seeing it for a whole year. That's that's like Pearl Harbor. You know, you don't get to say, well, you know, it was a it was a shock from the Japanese. You know, you don't get to do that. Let me so really let me ask how them. is Fed so missing on inflation? Is there yeah. now these are not those are different things that are going wrong, but the Fed really should be looking inside and saying, why is it we know so little about inflation? It's a good question. Well, I, I, I do. I think. Yeah. I, I think the answer. The answer to this is very right. clear, and that and that is that the the composition of the Fed. There are 416 economists at Fed headquarters. The Democrats out, outpace the Republicans 48.5 to one, and Milton Friedman and the quantity theory of money (MV equals PY) happen to be en enemies. Of the Democrats, so I think this has something to do with uh, with what's going on because Powell is de he deep six the Fed is deep six the quantity theory of money. They say there's no relationship, no regular. Yeah. Systematic Powell did say Powell did say we need to unlearn monetarism. He said that in 2021. I believe I brought and, that to your attention, John. I think John. he was right about that. So not not everybody thinks that was a bad idea. All right. <laughs> But the, well, the question is what 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 you think they should replace it with is different than what they, the price level. they would. <laughs> but, um, but let me let me. This, no, 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 yeah. no, this is this is re, this is related. This is very related to, to a blog that John put up about the CDC and the political composition of the CDC. John, you might want to make a remark about that because these these public institutions. Are staffed by people, and they and 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 it's clear they have more and more of, shall we say, an ideological point of view than most people think. The, these aren't robots running around. John, you might just mention that blog. I thought it was. In. We we completely agree on this, by the way. Thank you, Grumpy Connors blog. There is a. Uh, politically right now, what's going on is is um, in many administrative agencies, uh, far left wing politics are taking over and entrenching themselves. Now, you mentioned the Democrat Republican at the Fed. The problem is, of course, the economics, um, the Fed isn't really prejudiced. The economics, uh, the American Economic Association has the same Democrat to Republican ratios. Where I would fault the Fed is is not just on, on registrations, uh, but in a time when it has missed its number one uh, goal, inflation. Nonetheless, it has a huge team going after climate change. Now, climate change is important, but the Federal Reserve has essentially nothing to do with climate change. And uh, this mm -hmm. is an effort to politicize financial regulation, to use the power of the regulators to shut down oil companies uh, under the guise that somehow the climate in the next couple of years is going to threat the financial system. It, it, that's a dream. And similarly, many of the regional feds are off on um, inequality and racism and social justice. Yeah, Perhaps important issues, but not something that the Federal Reserve should be involved in and, and therefore has its eyes off the basics, which is inflation and, you know, uh, <laughs> Sam Bankman-Fried well, and the UK Pension Fund shows right. the basic financial regulation is completely broken. Well, let's uh, let's observe a few uh, government narratives and perhaps mainstream media narratives together and uh, examine the accuracy of these narratives. The first one being that uh, COVID lockdowns have greatly exacerbated supply chain issues, pushing up prices everywhere. Uh, let's examine that one first. How impactful were the lockdowns on inflation? Steve, I'll start with you. Well, 
John has already alluded to this. This this had big impact on relative price changes, but not the price level. In other words, the, the consumer price index, you have about 300 items in there. Well, and, and, and those items are, are moved, some of them move up, some of them move down. And, and, and if you have inflation, more and more of them are on the upside than the downside, and the whole basket moves up. So, so that's what happened. And you, you've got to have the, the monetary juice in the system to make the whole basket go up. If, and the best example of that is to look at Japan in the 1970s. In the 1970s, we, we had two oil crises. The first one was 1973, the Arab oil embargo. And, and the Bank of Japan, when the oil prices, the relative price of oil started going up, the Bank of Japan concluded, we better goose the money supply and accommodate that a little bit. Well, they got inflation because the money supply went up. In 1979, the second oil crisis hit, and the Bank of Japan says, no, we're, we're, we're not going to goose the money supply and accommodate that relative price increase. We will let the relative price increase, the price of oil go up relative to everything else, but we won't allow the price level itself to go up because we're goosing the money supply. And so you had inflation in Japan in the first oil crisis, and you had no inflation in the second one because the Bank of Japan was relatively tight in the second, and in the first, they were loose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, John, I'll let you respond uh, to the uh, lockdown question. How impactful were the lockdowns? Lockdown so we, we now know lockdowns are terrible for the economy. They killed the economy. A lot of why we got this inflation is the Fed and Treasury um, okay. thought we need gen generic stimulus to fight that fall. No, when you when you close the restaurants because of pandemic, the restaurants are closed, not because people don't have enough money to go to out to dinner. It's because, you know, you locked them down. And you saw that when the economy came back, it came back roaring. There wasn't any lack of demand there. So, uh, it, it, you know, if there were supply chain problems, but if people weren't trying to buy stuff on the other end of the supply chain, there wouldn't have been supply chain problems. So I think that's exactly right. Uh, President Joe Biden has called uh, the war on Ukraine uh, a monumental impact on inflation as well, and referring to inflation this year as the Putin price hike. How impactful, again, was Ukraine on inflation? Steve? I'll go first this time. Oh, no, Sean, that, yeah. That, John, go ahead. Putin price hike, which you were supposed to capitalize, was one of the administration's many sort of hilarious attempts to deflect uh, blame for the inflation. Uh, it was first, uh, it, you have to remember the story. There was the great chicken monopoly conspiracy to raise prices. There was greed. There was capitalism. There was the dog ate my homework. Then a year into inflation, it became Putin's price hike. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, so that, that uh, energy prices did go up, but that is doesn't uh, drive all of inflation. Uh, and the war is actually, it's, it's uh, a disaster for Europe, who's finding out their energy policy is a big mistake. At some point, we should talk about long-run growth and energy policies, which really matters. Yes. But as a big driver of inflation, uh, it's, it's like the energy shocks of the 1970s. Uh, it drives the price of energy up. That the price of one thing going up relative to everything else, well, it can go like that. 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 Uh, the overall level of prices just doesn't respond to one price going up relative to other things. Okay. Um, Steve, I'll let you comment on that, and we have to move on to our last segment, which is your outlook for inflation. So Putin price hike, diversion? Oh, I, I, I completely agree with John. He explained it better than I would, so let's All move right. on. Let's move on. Outlook on inflation, which ties into your outlook for long-run growth. John, I'll let you start. Uh, great uncertainty. So if the okay. Fed's 1,500 economists can't see 8% inflation coming, you know, don't listen to my forecast or Steve's forecast. You know, the one thing for readers... Well, you're, uh, both of your forecasts have been uh, relatively correct so far. So we are here to catch your no, opinion. We got lucky, we got lucky too. Uh, you know, All right. You know, on a scientifically valid forecast, uncertainty. I think it's going to gently fade back to around 3 or 4%, maybe 5%. And then it's going to be really sticky after that. Uh, I think really to get rid of inflation, we've got to solve our fiscal policy problem. All inflations get solved when you solve the fiscal policy problem, and otherwise they sit there like a sore. Okay. Uh, and 
Uh, the big question is, is when something bad happens or what happens. So I, I stay at night worrying, up at night worrying about the next crisis. Uh, China invades Taiwan, uh, for example, uh, shut down all of trade, massive recession. Uncle Sam goes out and says, this time I need $10 trillion to bail everybody out again, stimulus and so forth. What happens now? Uh, you know, now we, we found that fiscal wall that's right next to us. And that's the real lesson of inflation is that supply matters. For 10 years, all of the worthies of economics told us secular stagnation, all we need, inadequate demand, just print up more money, hand it out, that's the key to prosperity. No, we just found out there's only so much the economy can produce and we're right there, if not more. So really it's time to get back to the Murray Kondo cleanup of the economy. You, you know, long run growth is the only important thing. All this inflation and stuff, it's, it's second order. What matters is does productivity start growing? And there, the amount of sand in the gears of the economy, if you just look out the window, is tremendous. We'd love to grow, but you can't get the permits. Not, not even our, our environmental green friends can't get the permits. There, there, there's, there's some hope here. They've discovered, oh, I want to put in solar panels and windmills. But wait, it takes 15 years to get the environmental clearance to, cl to connect the darn thing to the grid. You know, Mother Gaia is going to be gone by then. Uh, so we're, we have these very bureaucratically infested slow economies. It costs the U.S. five times more than it costs France to build railroads <laughs> <laughs> speed trains. Come on, guys. We can do better than that. So it really, inflation tells us what the supply limit and the pro-growth agenda is the one that needs to come out. And and that, unfortunately, like the little hope in Pandora's box, that's the one nobody ever talks about. All right. So a reduction, but not outright to 2%. John, you didn't say it would uh, eventually hit the Fed's 2% target, right? I'm Unless guessing easy to 4% and then it won't, and then something bad will happen. Uh, or else, uh, um, you know, the only way it would get temporarily to do percent if was if we have a terrible recession. Mm. But I, I'm I'm guessing easy-ish to four or five percent. Then it gets stuck, and then and and we really need to solve the fiscal problem, or something else bad happens. Then it shoots up again. I, I'm looking at 1975 as our historical uh, episode. Goes down a while, then something bad happens and it shoots up again. Okay, Steve, I, I know you think inflation is going to stay elevated for a while as well. What's your what's your target range? Well, I, I uh, Greenwood and I are, are at five percent by the end of 2023. But if 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 the stance of the Fed continues and this contraction in the money supply continues, we, we could see a pretty sharp fall off in inflation in 2024. Now that's mm -hmm. that's getting a, a long way out there. So you got to put big probabilities on all these things. A lot of uncertainty, but but that's kind of the profile. Is it's it's coming down, going to be still persistent in 2023, and and could sharply fall off in 24 if if this current overdone whipsawing of the money supply occurs. Now on the long run thing, I what. What we really have in the United States is, is actually a kind of a bleak picture in my view, because since September 11, the US economy has become more politicized and more interventionist, the thing, the thing John was talking about. And, and as a result, our, they measure these measurements of economic freedom. For example, the, the Fraser Institute study does this. And, and those measurements are going down, down, down. And the potential growth for the U.S. is going down, down, down. The productivity is sagging, sagging, sagging. And that's all because you've got too many government fingers meddling around in the market. And everything now is politicized. You read the pay. There, there is nothing going on in the private sector without the government's fingers all over everything. You just read any newspaper. It's it's. It's unbelievable. Every, everything is political now. This is this is like I, I've spent a lot of time in underdeveloped countries and in underdeveloped countries, you read the paper every day to see what the government's doing, this thing or that thing that's going to affect you as a private person or a private business. Right. It's the same in the United States. It's like a develop, underdeveloped country almost. There are, well, some we've talked about this as well, you and I. Uh, some uh, some politicians, like uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, have blamed inflation on corporate price gouging. Um, we've talked about that. Uh, whether or not that actually is a core reason is a 
another 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 topic of debate. Uh, uh, John, I do want to uh, go back to you and talk a little bit about um, whether or not you think that the Fed will need to continue raising interest rates. Suppose your theory is correct and the fiscal side solves itself. Does the Fed need to be intervening in the uh, open markets anymore? Fiscal side doesn't solve itself. Congress wakes up, takes strong action to return the, the United States to fiscal right. long run fiscal sanity. Okay. And uh, we have many historical episodes where that magically cures inflation. Uh, it, it goes away on its own. Where, where we are is we still have, we're still spending like a drunken sailor and we're promising to keep doing that. And we're asking the poor Fed, it's kind of like the fiscal foot's on the gas and the poor Fed's hauling up on the parking brake trying to do something about it. Mm -hmm. I think we're, what we're going to discover uh, is... Um, that the Fed's power to limit inflation in the face of continued fiscal irresponsibility is much more limited than we thought. And here, I'll maybe, Steve will probably agree, but for monetarist reasons, simply raising interest rates is a tool with very limited power. Uh, and it's a tool that in the face of fiscal headwinds has even more limited power. For example, if you, if you agree with me that the deficits are fundamentally what's causing the inflation, Fed raises interest rates, causes a recession. What happens? Well, inflation goes down because the recession, but the fiscal policy will be stimulus, bailout, unemployment. Here we go. So that's going to cause the same, more of the same fiscal problem that's getting us into inflation. Furthermore, the Fed raises interest rates. Well, we have now 100% debt to GDP ratio. Every time the Fed raises interest rates, that raises the interest cost on the debt, which adds to the deficit. Europe is in even worse shape this way, because every time the ECB raises interest rates, Italy at 160% of debt to GDP ratio, its debt service costs go up. So uh, in the face of fiscal policy that can't, can't adapt, I think we're going to discover, we already, both Steve and I, for different reasons, think raising interest rates is a very blunt tool that isn't clearly, it clearly can cause a recession. Whether it clearly brings down inflation is much less obvious. And in the face of fiscal policy that's intractably irresponsible, you really have, it's, it's not clear that the Fed will be able to do much at all. Conversely, should we have that grand bargain and, and fix our fiscal problem, inflation could melt away. But it's not going to happen on its own. It's going to be hard work in Congress. Okay. Now, David, let, let, me, let me talk about uh, something that is related to uh, to John's thinking on the fiscal side, but moving away from the United States. And uh, John, John has his fiscal theory. I have my favorite monetary institution, which is a currency board system that, that I've put in in various places, including Bulgaria, when, when the inflation, by the way, was 242% per month, per month, when we put the currency board in, in 1997. So that, that eliminated the hyperinflation immediately. And the reason I like these currency boards is the fact that it, they aren't central banks. They can't extend credit to the fiscal authorities. They can't monetize a deficit. And as a result, you, you get bliss, according to Cochran, and that is a balanced budget. And the, and the reason for that, by the way, just to explain what, what is a currency board, the Bulgarian currency board, it, it issues a local currency, a lev. That currency trades at a fixed exchange rate with the euro and is freely convertible and is backed 100% with euro reserve. So it, that is all they do. They're exchanging lev for anchor currency, lev for anchor currency. That's all they do. They can't create money. They can't extend credit to the fiscal authorities. And so you've had one government after another for 25 years in Bulgaria. It doesn't matter if they're left wing, right wing, center, you name it. They always balance the budget. They have the second lowest debt to GDP ratio of any country in the EU. And, and that, that gets to this point. What is the bad institution? And it gets back to the money thing and, and Milton Friedman thing. Mm -hmm. It's central banks. If you did away with central banks in these developing countries, you would impose a hard budget constraint. You you get a you get a John Cochran kind of budget discipline thing, and 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 by the way, you would have no inflation. Okay, I want to uh, end on uh, great points from both of you. Uh, I want to end on this uh, question. 
more of a theoretical question, uh, and how to prevent inflation from ever getting out of control. There's been a number of theories proposed by different people that I've talked to. Um, wh one of them is a return to a gold standard. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, uh, a gold-backed currency. It could be backed by any hard asset. It could be potentially even backed by a digital asset like Bitcoin. Um, but the idea that your fiat currency is tied to some sort of other peg and that would uh, solve the issue of having higher inflation. People have pointed to the fact that during Bretton Woods, uh, up until 1971, there wasn't very high inflation in the U.S., and so perhaps that has worked. How would you respond? John, I'll let you talk. Well, the gold standard won't work for the U.S., uh, sorry, because okay. gold, gold is not a, a, an important part of our monetary system uh, anymore. The gold standard, like the currency board, primarily functions as a fiscal commitment, because no government ever has enough gold to back all its debt might have enough to back its currency, as even in a currency board, you don't have enough uh, uh, foreign currency to back all of your debt. But it's a commitment. We are going to pay off our debts at this price rather than some other price. So I think it is possible for a uh, to get to a system that has all the good advantages of a gold standard and of a currency board, which you can't use a currency board for the U.S. because who are we going to peg to, um, but has all those good advantages. Uh, and I, I call it a CPI standard, a uh, basic... Um, a way of targeting the entire CPI, not just one commodity. Uh, so I'll, I'll advertise my book has some chapters on that idea. Uh, I think it's possible to do. I think I think we're a ways away from it. Uh, it would start by targeting the difference between um, indexed and non-indexed debt rather than just the level of interest rates, get the Fed out of the business of deciding what the right level of interest rates is. So I think it's possible. Um, there's some theory ideas in the book, uh, but it's not as, as easy as just go back to gold or currency board, which you can't, neither of which would work for the U.S. economy. Okay. I think, I think ultimately what, what, what we're saying, you, you need some kind of rule. Fiscal monetary rule tying you, you the need, CPI down. Right. You, now now we, we, we have no rules. They're, they're, everything is discretionary. Everything is discretionary now. That's that's the problem. Why, and, why does the Fed this, have a two percent target? Where did that come from? This is more you know monetary history, but uh, it, it does Congress seem arbitrary. Said price stability, didn't it? And I think price stability means price stability. And they two percent kind of wafted around the building in, in group speak, and it, everyone it, decided two percent. Yeah, it, it actually came from New Zealand. I mean, that New Zealand was the first one to do it. But 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 the, but but the the. the, the the one, one way to look at the rule is to go back to the quantity theory of money and the equation of exchange, M, M, MV equals PY. And if you, if you solve for M, that, that's the golden growth rate. And the golden growth rate is a rate of money growth that's consistent with hitting a 2% inflation target. You yeah, can plug it the zero. thing in. And, and, and the rule then would be now, it, you would adjust it over time and so forth, but it's around five and a half or six percent or something like that. But you could have a zero percent target as well as a two percent target, and it's we, not obvious. Oh, yeah, to... yeah, we we, we yeah we could plug we could have we could have zero as a target, and solve for it, and if if that was the case, the growth rate in the money supply would be you know about two percent less than I gave you, maybe three and a half or four yeah. percent. What about the concept of the? Uh... Sorry, the, the talk now is, of course, uh, get used to inflation. A lot of people want to say, just raise the, here's the solution to inflation, just raise the inflation target to four or 5% and let our children yeah. and grandchildren have four or 5% inflation forever. Not not my idea, but once you've accepted two, you know, why not? Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, question. Final question, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you guys go. Uh, mm -hmm. Great, great, great discussion. Uh, there's this concept of the uh, non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, which is to target an unemployment rate such that you have no excess growth and no overheating of the economy to cause a spiraling of prices. Does that make sense to you? Is that a policy someone should pursue? No. <laughs> okay. It comes from the, so Steve and I have two different theories of inflation. It comes from a third theory of inflation that says inflation fundamentally is driven by unemployment relative to this unemployment rate. The Phillips curve that kind yes. of morphed into a, a theory, not a statistical observation. The trouble was nobody could ever figure out what the non-inflationary unemployment rate was in real time. You know, they could always figure out what it was five years ago, but no one can tell is it 2%, 5%, oh, labor market shifts or whatever. So it's not, it has not proved 
a guidepost for what is the level of heating of the economy that, that turns in, into inflation or not. So uh, <clears throat> I, I think it's uh, uh, not a good guidepost for monetary policy. Okay, I, 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 I fully agree. And, and by the way, if, if you do the measurements, if you, if you have 10 different experts doing the measurements of what the, this should be, you get 10 different answers. Yeah, it, 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 it's a fa it's a phantom. I mean, you, you, if, if you can't agree on the number, how in the world we, we agree on a target? Unemployment in, in modern labor economics, unemployment is actually not that important a concept. It's the number of people who are now looking for jobs. It's not the number of people who are not working. That's the labor force participation rate, which is kind of a disaster, no matter what the unemployment rate is. Uh, unemployment is about people cycling in and out, looking for jobs, finding them, quitting, looking again. It's just not that, uh, it's not, that is not the central force driving the level of all prices and wages up and down. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, gentlemen, I, I appreciate your time. We can talk for hours. There's a lot more to unpack, uh, perhaps another time, perhaps another time, but, uh, we got through the meat of our conversation. Thank you to uh, John. Thank you to Steve. Any last words before we go? It's just a pleasure to talk to you guys. You too, Steve. Yeah, thank, yeah thanks. It's great, great to see both of you. And, and uh, again, I, I, I can freely plug John's book, Princeton <laughs> University Press, January 17th. You can, uh, yeah, it, please it, do check it it's, out. It's, 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 it's not only a good read, it, it's, it's a big read. Well, well I'll, I'll plug for normal readers, I have an essay called uh, Fiscal History, as you can find on my website, which is the version without the equations, and it's only like 50 pages, not 530. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got through part of that book. It was a very interesting read. Yeah, <laughs> not designed for economists, so that's All right. okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Um, hey, th thank thank you both. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, John. And thank you for watching Kitco News. Stay tuned for more. Don't forget to subscribe. I'm David Lynn.